Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and this is David's thesis defense. Um, I don't know if all I think you know Maria. Um, and um, Dr. Heckler is from um, the third committee member, and he's from the uh, Department of Physics. And also was a participant. Uh, in the study. So the way this is going to go, David will present for about 45 minutes or so, after which um, we'll have questions from all of the guests um, for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and at that point, then we'll ask you guys to leave, and the committee will continue to have a conversation with David. Okay. Also, I'm just going to switch off the slides. Oh, great. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, my, uh, Thesis was entitled. Okay. These are entitled Prototyping the Co-Designers to Imagine Future Experiences. Liz quickly introduced my committee members. Um, I'll maybe just give you a little overview into why um, or their their support, but they've given me Liz, my main advisor, um, really sort of helped me a lot with the um, co-designing aspect, participatory aspects, and really adding a lot of clarity to the work I was doing. Um, Maria was a huge help to me in uh, really sort of um, pushing me into that reflective practice um, as I was going through this process, but also um, helping me a lot with the, the sort of design outcomes that you'll see later on. And then Dr. Andrew Heckler, um, as Liz mentioned, was a participant, but also um, was, uh, I guess, a collaborator and was a really um, supported throughout the process. And without him, this probably would look very different. Okay. Uh, so I'll get started. Um, a quick overview. I want to talk a little bit about my motivations for coming back to, uh, to coming to graduate school in uh, Ohio State. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the background and how both of those inform my research objectives and questions, uh, my research approach, and really the focus of my primary um, study within the research. Uh, co-designing student experience with stakeholders at the uh, Department of Physics. Um, I'll go into detail about that, methodology, discussion, reflection, conclusions, uh, a little bit about future work, and then some time, hopefully, for some questions at the end. So my motivations. Uh, I graduated in 2009 from a, a product design program at the University of Edinburgh. And it was a really modernist uh, design approach that we were taught um, within that program. I worked as a furniture and product designer um, in the UK, in Europe, and in South Korea before coming back to school to be here at Ohio State University. And one of my motivations for coming back really was to change three aspects of uh, my design um, thinking uh, in terms of my role, my medium, and my approach. So my role shifting from a product and furniture designer, sort of thinking about things, more to a design researcher and designer of experiences. Uh, my medium, so prototyping tangible things, the chairs and the tables and the coffee cups you have in front of you, and to, like I said, experiences and systems. And finally, my approach, from a design approach, uh, which I was taught and trained in, which involves peers and mentors and a lot of people in this room, uh, to a co-design approach, which involves those same people, but also brings in stakeholders as equal partners in the process. So a little bit about the background in terms of the design landscape. Um, I had the chance to meet with Peter Jan Staffers last year, and when we were talking about my research, um, he said this, and from my perspective as a furniture designer, uh, being having a modernist design background, um, I really related to this quote in terms of it isn't really just about chairs anymore, and design is expanding into other realms and other areas. So the Design Collective are a group um, and what they really focus on is how uh, modernist design methods can be applied to helping uh, have practical ways to solve uh, larger complex issues. Uh, Norman considers that the designer would be important in creating experiences and systems um, and brings a different or a unique perspective as we bring that sort of human-centered perspective that we're always considering the needs of the people within the system. So that's a little overview, and these sort of inform my research objectives and questions. So my first objective was really to understand how my traditional or modernist design skills, like sketching, prototyping, making, 
could be applied to understanding experiences and systems. And secondly, um, to engage multiple stakeholders as co-designers in this process. It's a little overview. Uh, co-design uh, can be defined as collective creativity as it is applied across the whole span of the design process. Um, we might have to get another chair when you go. Um, I can stay there. Yes. Um, on the left here, we have a traditional example of uh, how the user informs the process, the, how the researcher is involved, and then this is then handed to the designer in order to generate ideas. Um, with co design, all of those people playing sort of uh, roles together in that process in order to generate new ideas and solutions. People are ducks, David. I think you need to be clear about this. <laughs> yeah, maybe duck people. Yes. <laughs> um, prototypes. So uh, a prototype can be, uh, there's a lot of debate, as uh, Brian David Johnson from Intel says, about what a prototype actually is. And that really depends on what field you're coming from. Uh, systems engineer considers a prototype will look and feel very differently to what a mechanical engineer might think, to what a product designer might think. But prototyping across all different disciplines really is a means for designers to take tangible, or sorry, abstract ideas, analysis, and theories and turn them into sort of tangible outcomes and experiential things. This is the double diamond from uh, the UK Design Council, and it sort of defines the, the areas of research and design. And these two diamonds sort of showing you where ideas or where people are um, diverging and converging in their thinking. Um, and this is where prototypes sort of traditionally live, um, or at least from my perspective when I was being taught in modern design. What I was interested in is to understand how these prototyping methods could be used later in the process. So introducing them into the research phase. Mm -hmm. Earlier. Earlier. Did I say later? Earlier. Definitely earlier. So I define a prototype as any representation of a design idea regardless of medium. A good prototype can really be understood in terms of where it's being used in the process by the designer in terms of how they're using it to either evaluate, explore, or understand the problem. So these inform my research questions, which I was interested to explore. So what are the roles of the designer and the co-designer in this process? How can prototypes be used to generate new ideas? How can co-designers be supported collectively to create new experiences and meet their needs and goals? And how can they act as remain as active voices in the process? My research approach uh, stems from design, uh, research for design by Zimmerman and Polizzi, or established or talked about a lot by them, and really looking at uh, research and designers and our roles and the artifacts that we produce, and reflecting on that process. Um, I took a slightly different spin on that approach and really wanted to look at research through co-design as a way of not only understanding my role and my thoughts and reflections, and the artifacts themselves, but also how the co-designers play into that process. So I want to talk to you uh, about the sort of primary focus of the study, which was co-designing student experience with physics stakeholders. Um, there's me and there's Dr. Andrew Heckler there. Um, we met uh, originally through uh, Henry Griffey, who was an e-grants uh, coordinator. And I met Henry, and he knew that I wanted to do a design project uh, for my thesis, but we didn't really know what it was going to be or who it was going to be working with. But he was great in terms of having suggestions of people I could talk to and people that might be interested. So I met with Andrew and uh, sorry, Dr. Heckler, and um, we really, um, initially it was about interface design and about essential skills. That was the start of our conversation, but as we talked more, we sort of started thinking about the, the wider student experience of specifically introductory physics for freshman students. So based on those initial discussions, we started to form some questions, my own questions, and how they relate to uh, my research questions, and also Dr. Heckler in terms of uh, what the current and ideal student experience could be, and how that could be supported virtually. Based on our initial discussions, we started to put together a list of key stakeholders that would be associated with introductory physics. 
These included faculty, grads, staff, and students. This was a process diagram of the first, uh, the early phase of our uh, co-design effort. Uh, myself and Dr. Heckler met here in the, in the initial interviews, and then we went through three phases of um, in myself interviewing with the key stakeholders, and then taking these stakeholders into two workshops, and then finally bringing all of the key stakeholders together in this third workshop to ideate around uh, ideal student experience for introductory things. What you see in between is everything that I was doing uh, while we were moving through this process. So I started with interviews and interviewing all the different stakeholders. Um, I would ask a series of questions related to the current and sort of ideal experience that they would like to see uh, from a graduate, faculty, staff, and student perspective. Part of that interview process, I had a card sorting activity in which I presented a, a set a deck of cards to my participants and asked them to select five cards that they thought represented an ideal or a positive future and three that exact represented a negative future. So after interviewing all those stakeholders, we put together a, a, the, um, the results. And the larger the image is, the more times it was selected by one of the um, stakeholders. So here was a positive future, which really focused on uh, more um, attention to group work and developing more community. Um, this idea of sort of exploring and trying to understand um, the concepts related to physics and education. This was the negative future. Again, the larger the image is, the more times it was selected. And I think they sort of speak for themselves in a way. Um, certainly the central ones, there was an idea of students being overloaded with too much information and not having enough time to process it. So from those interviews and from the results of the card sorting exercises, I generated what I'm calling prototype seeds. So the seeds were uh, a series of ideas that were generated during the interview stage that were either sort of inspired and informed by the faculty, staff, students, or from the secondary research. I generated these seeds in order to introduce them into the first series of workshops as a way to sort of guide the participants and to think of maybe alternative ideas. We then moved into a phase of two workshops. So the first workshop was with faculty and staff. Um, they did a sort of exercise around um, their current learning experience using a set of make tools to understand their views and experience on the current experience. And then we moved into what I'm considering to be the second prototyping exercise of vision mapping. So taking sort of physical objects and um, creating uh, what the landscape would look like for an ideal student experience in the future. At this point, I also introduced these prototype seeds um, as a way for the participants, the co-designers, to um, place them within the, the experience they were building. Um, this was entirely optional, however, so if they didn't think that something would heighten or improve the experience, there was no need to include that. These were in the form of little baseball cards that the co-designers could like add into the, the environment. And this is what the faculty created, um, faculty and staff. Uh, they created the sort of ideal classroom experience um, for introductory physics. And it centered a lot around um, more group work and more like hands-on activities um, to really engage the students. Here's our annotated version of some of the main ideas that came out of that session. So as I said before, group activities, intentional group composition, and the blues are different um, sort of methods in terms of uh, engaging students uh, to, to learn. So after we did faculty and staff, then um, did a similar work, the same workshop with students. So this is what the students created. Um, the students created the, uh, the ideal uh, campus or landscape. So we have uh, the like, dormitory here, in the classroom here, and then the students are sort of in different locations. These masts 
represent this virtual network which the students were able to like connect with each other and with staff and faculty and instructors. Within the classroom they imagined something that would allow uh, students to virtually engage uh, in the class without actually being there. And again this is an annotated version of the, the outcomes from their vision mapping exercise. So the final workshop brought everybody together, faculty, students and staff, to share these two vision maps and move forward in a, the same direction. In order to inform the uh, co-designers before they came to the workshop, I generated a, a summary video which explained to the, the participants of each workshop what had happened in those workshops so we were all on the same page in that third uh, workshop together. So the first part of the workshop really was an exercise in uh, consolidating the two different visions and the ideas that come out of those and finding some common ground and commonality between those. We then sort of zoomed in and focused on certain aspects of those visions which they considered to be key or could be really um, you know, important to improving the student experience. And in sort of mixed stakeholder groups, we have staff, student, and faculty. Um, we did a prototyping exercise of rough storyboarding. So sort of zooming in on a certain aspect of that vision and imagining what the experience would be from the ground level. So this is one of the storyboards that was created by the mixed stakeholder groups. And this was the uh, idea of concept which we would develop further. It was this idea of a face-to-face -face study group app that would allow students to, to meet and to work together. So that was the, the end of our first phase, or the early phase, of the process. We then moved into the uh, design phase, and I'll go through each of these tracts in a little bit more detail. But we're moving from left to right. As we left the, the research and moved into the design phase, we identified three deliverables which would be important to really um, tell the story and sort of convey the, the ideas that had been expressed in that workshop. So I'll go through each of them. There was a journey map, a scenario video, and an app interface. Um, I'll start with the journey map. So the journey map really is a, a visual way in which to sort of convey an experience or a system to somebody. Um, we went through a process of uh, the boxes along the, the blue boxes you can see are sort of what was being produced or what was happening then. In between is sort of what I, I myself or the uh, co-designers would do. So the vision mapping really started with taking all of the ideas that had come out of across those three workshops and really trying to consolidate them into something that could visually describe um, a lot of the ideas that had come out of the workshop. Um, so this started with sort of taking all of the ideas and sort of starting to sketch out and consolidate them and then moving from sort of paper to a digital format in order to sort of develop these journey maps. So we created two journey maps, one for the current experience and one for the ideal, in order to sort of have a compare and contrast in terms of what the current versus ideal states are like. So with this current state, uh, students go through lecture, recitation, and lab. Um, but there was a lot of talk about that there's perhaps not a great connection from a student perspective in terms of the content that's being delivered and how they, they are making connections across the three. And students, this isn't a typical week, students have office hours which they can attend and they complete most of their homework and their essential skills quizzes uh, on Carmen. There are student groups and a lot of people talked about the study groups but there was no sort of formal structure to these. So as a comparison, this was the ideal sort of vision that came out of the three workshops. So there was a combination of lecture, lab, and recitation into something similar to scale-up classroom. And students would be exposed to sort of all three um, within a, a given uh, lesson. The setup and activities and approach were really more focused on small groups and activity-based learning sort of hands-on experiments, calculations, and analysis. 
There was also the introduction of some of the concepts that have come out, such as the um, ability for students to virtually connect with faculty or staff or um, maybe not staff, uh, instructors. And um, also within the study group, the idea that they could um, have a virtual network which they could connect to each other. And for this to sort of to work successfully, Carmen was integrated across the, the whole experience in a, in a more closer fashion. And the homework activities as well, focusing on different types of homework activities, so small projects, written assignments, more group discussion. The scenario video, so I mentioned earlier the concept of the study group app, which came out of the workshops. We decided to focus on this as a means to understand further the use of scenario videos in describing or prototyping experience. So based off those initial storyboards that you saw in the, uh, the workshop, I then started to sketch out and sort of moving in more higher fidelity the, uh, the story that had come out of the workshop. So we initially started with some rough sketches and moved into a more detailed script and supporting images. And then as I was developing these storyboards, I would take them back to the co-designers and share them with them and get their input on whether they were believable, what changes would have to be made, does this really represent the, the idea that we discussed within the workshop. Then took these storyboards and created a short scenario video, which I'm going to share with you in a little bit, um, to sort of convey the concepts and the experience. And finally, the app interface itself, which you saw an image of there, um, the storyboard became really important as part of the process in developing this interface. And um, put together a toolkit of um, the storyboard that you saw earlier and some simple wireframing and um, paper prototypes in order to engage the co-designers to create what that experience would be like. So we met with, uh, met with seven, six of um, the co-design participants. Some of them were from the workshop, some of them were, were new to the process. And really, um, as I met with each participant, we went through a sort of iterative process of developing what the experience would be like. At this point, it really wasn't about the interface itself, it was more about the experience which was being conveyed through the storyboard and how the <coughs> application would support that. And here's an example of some of the stills that came out of that session. I then took those and developed them into a digital interface, so taking um, the paper, pro paper prototypes as the framework and generating a uh, click-through prototype, so something that gives you a feel and sense of the front-end experience without actually developing the back-end. So what I would like to do now is I quickly share with you the, uh, the scenario video which uh, we created to um, convey this experience.
assumptions or hypotheses about the current um, student experience and also to gauge their response to this concept. Um, so we found some really interesting, um, I guess, outcomes from the current experience sort of validating some of the ideas that we had. Um, we had, I think, 201 students complete the survey and 196 responded. They watched the video and then had a pretty positive response of sort of 92% saying they would either definitely or maybe uh, use the application. So that was the uh, sort of the research process, um, or sort of the research and the design process within the co-design uh, effort. Uh, what I want to talk now a little bit is about my discussions and findings and reflections on that process. So here is uh, the different prototypes that I used across the co-design process, um, moving from sort of in uh, chronological order. The ones in the purple circle are uh, created by myself, the ones in the blue were made by the co-designers, and the ones that share the circles were created by both of us, they're more of a collaborative effort. So the seeds as prototypes. Um, what I found with uh, the seeds that were generated from the interviews uh, not only allowed the uh, stakeholders to sort of explicitly um, tell me what they thought could improve the experience, but also as a moment of uh, reflection for myself in terms of the implicit knowledge that I had gained from those interviews. The seeds really acted as a moment of reflection for me, the designer, in order to introduce these ideas. Um, but they also acted within the workshop themselves as sort of what I'm defining as weak boundary objects, so almost like framing and part of the uh, the outcome was to be sort of uh, how can virtual tools support the, the learning experience. So it allowed us to um, sort of, they were sort of weak enough so they weren't uh, sort of forced to, to use the, the ideas, but they were strong enough that they could be incorporated if they thought they were going to be uh, a benefit. So, Berganti and Norman say that human-centered approach of iterative development uh, can always make incremental changes, but maybe doesn't lead to like radical in innovation. I, my point with the seeds is the introduc introduction of these into the early phases of this iterative process can potentially um, produce more radical outcomes and applications. In terms of the maps, uh, the big difference between the two was the faculty focused on the classroom and the students focused on the campus. So between the two, there were two different perspectives um, that were because of that, but both of them created environments, I think importantly. I was asking uh, both groups to sort of prototype and create something that would uh, represent an ideal experience. Um, but in both cases, they created an environment in which that experience could be played out in. Um, prototypes themselves as manifestations uh, allowed the discussion to take on a physical form, which allowed for the discussion to have more sort of concrete and be more grounded. 
Um, it also helped to build what Neuer calls a shared mental model. So everybody that left had a similar, there wasn't any ambiguity about the concept that was being generated. In terms of the storyboards, uh, they produced uh, really good discussion, really good uh, ideas around the experience. Um, but to take these and to show them to an external audience, it was hard to understand what it actually kind of discussed or what the outcomes really were. Um, Sanders and Staffers and Convivial Toolbox talk about um, scaffolding required um, in the creative practice. And I could probably say that there was perhaps not enough scaffolding um, in terms of materials that could support the creative process for them to successfully produce storyboards that could be conveyed to an outside audience. Rhino describes the three purposes of prototypes to be a learning tool for designers, a learning tool for users, and to sort of, as I mentioned, uh, transfer this knowledge to an external team. I would say that the first two were really successful, but the introduction of the summary video was required in order to um, allow these ideas to be conveyed to external uh, people that weren't part of the workshop. Uh, Matt Ratto in Critical Making uh, shares the same concern, uh, creating Arduino-based systems to convey uh, grander ideas of, um, such as the gift economy between groups of people. Um, the, in the moment, in that workshop, the discussion and the ideas that are generated are really interesting, rich, and provoking. But it's hard to convey that to an external audience. The journey map is the prototype. And for myself, um, the method of drawing and sketching and understand the nodes and relationships between the system um, was something that I found to be really important as I went through this process of sense making and putting together all of the different uh, ideas that come out of the workshop. However, at some point I had to transition over to a, a digital, um, moving from like paper to the uh, digital, and Tom Wujek from Autodesk and his uh, TED talk, I think it's um, How to Make Toast, talks about the need for uh, whatever material you're using to be flexible and more fluid in order to create better models. The sketching was great early on to give me an ability to sort of take directly what I was processing and putting it out on paper, but at some point it became too rigid, too structured. I needed something that would allow me to manipulate and move things more freely. And I think this is where the, the digital aspect of applications like Illustrator and design became more important. The scenario videos, um, so me being part of the discussion, me being part of those workshops was really important so I could then really take a true sense of the ideas that had come out of that workshop and sort of raise the fidelity of those ideas in order to convey them to an external audience. Uh, as I met with the co-designers one-on-one, uh, -on -one, as I was sharing with them the storyboards and developing the application interface, I sort of noticed a change in the relationship. And um, within the workshops, uh, if I go even back further, within the interviews, they were participants uh, in, in forming a, a project. Within the workshops, um, I was the facilitator and spent more time sort of providing instruction and guidance as opposed to really actively creating with the participants in that moment. But in these one-on-one -on -one meetings, it really was more of a collaborative effort between ourselves, it gave me the ability to use these modernist design skills of sketching and making in a, in a, in a much more uh, collaborative manner. Unexpectedly, uh, making the video uh, was really insightful in terms of seeing, you know, in real life, uh, in real time, the sort of ideas that we had generated on these storyboards and seeing people actually act that out in the, these spaces really provided another feedback loop for me as we were going through the process in terms of being able to watch them move through the space and interact with each other and really asking the questions, like, is that believable? Would they but they really do that. But even their reaction to me as well, at one point I had to pretend that I was the instructor on Skype speaking to them. And their, their body language changed really quickly from when they were speaking to each other, from when they were speaking to this um, fictional instructor over Skype. So just that little, those like little, uh, I guess, 
insights into the student, which I've probably forgotten about, but the student relationship between undergraduates and instructors and faculty. Changed how? And they became like a lot more sort of formal and a little bit like, I guess, um, I forget that I'm probably viewed to the you know, freshman students. I guess they, when I was putting on the, the role of the instructor, they became like a little bit more like, they just looked like students at that point. It's, it's hard to, Whereas before it was like quite friendly, we were just chatting back and forth, and then they became very formal and sort of, sort of a little bit nervous and giggly. Um, but the implication is that's not an insight that you had uncovered in any stage of the process. It was, it was sort of through enacting the scenario that that. Yeah, I think definitely through that enacting element. that scenario, that element came into play. The interface is a prototype. Um, was really powerful in combined with the storyboard in the sense that we weren't really creating the um, the look and feel. It, what, the conversation wasn't about the aesthetics. It wasn't about which button should go where. It was really more about the rules of interaction and how this experience would be brought to life. As the co-designers had been involved in the process of actually generating the, the, the design brief, the direction that we were moving in, we also, I also found a sense that there's a lot more engagement and a lot more ownership of the ideas that we were discussing. The application interface itself and being of a low fidelity allowed the co-designers to engage with it in a way which we were continually generating more ideas. Um, Belushi talks about the unfinished form and how it's able to foster um, more user engagement and, and spin off ideas and, in a more generative manner. As we moved into the digital output, the, uh, the engagement became different with the prototype and it became more of a, an evaluative process of that button, I don't like the color of that, or I don't understand what this is, but it became more about the interface and less about the experience that it was um, supporting. Overarching reflections, uh, the designer as um, Reinhardt talks about the design thinking process is based on the intuitive um, process uh, workflow of the designer. And I definitely felt that during the process getting from A to B, there was a certain amount of improvisation that had to take place in order for us to successfully, re successfully reach these outcomes. Um, if I compare it to a research process, the research process you define everything you're going to do in the beginning and you follow that process no matter what the outcomes are. And so whether you succeed or fail, um, as long as you follow the process, then you're being successful. I'm not sure research is that rigorous. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty much uh, a very flexible process too, but I mean maybe that's different for what, you know, what you're talking about. But. I think maybe I've spent a lot of time with engineers. <laughs> no, I think even that, maybe the, maybe the goal is that's not necessarily true. I think it's a very um, fluid process. Often, it depends. I mean, it depends. On it. it can be very fluid. I guess we use another way of saying it. it's definitely not as rigid as I'm yeah, suggesting. Okay. Well, um, I'll say maybe they're both fluid. One's more. Maybe fluid. the goal is the goals are different. I think. Yeah. Well, the, how do you how do you think about how the goals are different? I think within this process itself, the goals of the outcomes were really important to find in the beginning. We knew, that we knew we wanted to focus on that, that area of student experience, but we didn't really know what the outcomes were going to be. So I think you're right, maybe the goals are different. Within that process, having a designer as somebody who can sort of navigate and, and sort of engage with that, or embrace the sort of ambiguous nature of going from uh, having a, a, a sort of broad area to focus on and then narrowing down into outcomes and solutions is important, especially when working in between the space between research and design, um, I think becomes pretty critical. So my conclusions. Um, so in, in order to frame what I've, what I've been doing, uh, I want to use this model from Sanders and Staffers in terms of uh, Research, the research approach, the design approach, and 
the, the sort of bridge of the gap in between in the context of um, design. So research moving from sort of data information to knowledge to generating theories in order to inform these outcomes and design um, really being more focused on sort of inspiration. We look at it from one side, this is sort of gathering and um, evaluating and synthesizing information and this is perhaps more about inspiration. So to introduce the double diamond model again, and if I think of this as the co-design process, what I wanted to do was to take where prototypes are um, traditionally live with a modernist design and apply them further back into the research phase. Um, the different questions that I was asking along the way, like what could it be? And that maybe goes back to the goals in terms of we were really defined in the beginning what it was that was going to be the outcome. Uh, so we're getting to a point of what is it, and then finally, sort of what do you think? So I take the prototypes that we use and put them across this process and sort of get a sense of where they fall within the research and within the design, and where they fall sort of in between. So taking the information and knowledge that was generated in the research and successfully applying, applying it to the design outcomes. If I think of the fidelity in prototyping in the front end and taking that same approach of research design and this gap or bridge in between where the uh, different prototyping methods fell within um, this framework. I would say that the prototype seeds that I introduced into the vision mapping were a way to sort of push the co-designers and act as a catalyst to uh, think of new or otherwise unconsidered ideas. As we moved through the process, the, uh, as I mentioned, the response from the participants sort of changed. And we began sort of a generative motion and then moved more towards the sort of evaluative ends. Um, repositioning prototypes as matters of concern can give abstract notions uh, such as experience or uh, services of physical form. And as I mentioned before, this helps co-designers to create a shared mental model. Uh, iterating, or the iterative process we took from moving from one from the research phase to the design phase, uh, really helped to successfully translate the ideas that have been generated within those sessions uh, into the final outcomes. If I think about the roles of the designer in the process, uh, here we have on the, the Y is co-designer's expert, designer's expert, and again, the co-design process. Um, established roles being that of the form giver for the designer, new roles or sort of emerging roles being that of facilitator, interpreter, or sense maker. Um, and I also consider new roles or emerging roles uh, within these different parts of the process, such as provocateur, liaison, and process guide. Um, I would say that the process guide was the overriding role that I took on throughout the process um, in terms of uh, guiding the, the outcome or guiding the, the co-designers. I think a major advantage of being part of this process is the ability to successfully communicate the ideas that were generated here and into to an external audience by raising the fidelity of the outcomes. In terms of the involvement of the co-designers, uh, on the left here we have uh, Sherry Arnstein's uh, ladder of participation. And again, across time, across the co-design process. Um, here I have the faculty, staff, grads, and students, and each color represents a different participant uh, co-designer in the process. Each dot represents uh, when we met. And what I feel like I gained from the process in, in terms of the role of the co-designer is that some were really just informing the process. Some uh, were interviewed and some participated in the workshops but didn't really go any further than that. Whereas for others they sort of remained part of the process and were, were involved in that, um, that iterative um, development of the ideas. The, uh, the dotted line sort of represents when one co-designer and participant sort of introduced somebody new into the process who then introduced somebody new again. 
So this idea of there's sort of a moving from simply informing the, uh, the process to almost becoming partners within the process itself. From a learning perspective, I think something that was uh, really evident to me in the, the vision mapping was uh, when creating sort of educational tools and considerations, it's really important to have those different perspectives. And if we had had just the faculty, then we would have only ever focused on the classroom. But we wouldn't, and if we focused just on the students, we would have just had the, the campus, but without any real detail about what was actually, what learning was taking place. So for me, it was a, the importance of having different perspectives while working within a shared complex concern. In terms of future work, um, I was looking at how the prototypes can be applied across the, the research phase and where I thought that they could um, be used. Uh, I do think that the prototype sees as a, a catalyst in generative design in order to push co-designers or participants in different or uh, unexpected directions and could have um, definitely more into further exploration. And the bridge or the, the sort of space between research and design I would really need to focus on in terms of a space where more perhaps tools and methods need to be considered and to actively engage co-designers in order to successfully translate those ideas that are generated in the research to the design outcomes. Now a lot of the prototypes that I used were sort of taken directly from the existing sort of prototypes that are used by designers today. Perhaps um, taking those and using them in a different way or incorporating them in a different way in order to successfully engage co-designers in the process. That's my list of references. Uh, thank you very much.